2024 silly season has been one of the silliest we've seen in a long time. A driver of Carlos Sainz's quality, having to pick between a team with zero points and a team with 17 points was just the most insane way to really kick things off. Then, Logan Sargent somehow got a better mid-season send-off than Daniel Ricciardo did. What we've ended up with is four confirmed rookies for 2025, probably a fifth coming, and somehow a sixth one might be appointed as well. I'd actually completely forgotten that Jack Durham was starting his career at Alpine until this week. Somehow, the madness that was all started by Lewis Hamilton abandoning Mercedes mid-contract for a move to Ferrari still isn't over. And today, I'll tell you why. I'm George, you're watching F1 Reverse, and this is Don't At Me, the show where I get to give some of my own opinion on the madness that has been this season's silly season and what's still to come. Winter has well and truly started here in the UK now, which means I'm living in a continuous state of drizzle and grayscale colors. Um, so sorry if the lighting's a bit dodgy today. Not really a lot I can do about it, to be honest. It's just the UK's terrible weather. So, as things stand, 19 of the 20 seats for next season are filled. Officially, at least, Red Bull's second team, VCARB, is the only team with an empty space. Unofficially, though, there is far more uncertainty over next season's grid. And I'm not just talking about Sergio Perez, who I'll get onto later. With Sauber's announcement that they'll be signing Gabriel Bortoletto to join Nico Hülkenberg next year, Franco Colapinto's chances of finding a Formula 1 seat for next season should really be finished. Assuming that Red Bull honor Sergio Perez's contract and keep him on next year, the only remaining seat on the grid will surely go to Liam Lawson, who is currently occupying that seat. The New Zealander was brought in to replace Daniel Ricciardo before the Grand Prix at Monza, and while his contract is only for this season, I mean, a few people are going to bet against Red Bull actually hiring him for next year. So if we take F1 contracts at face value, which probably shouldn't ever really do to be honest, um, Franco Colapinto won't be in Formula 1 next year. Despite all the hype surrounding him, it seems he's going to have to head back to F2 for another season. Well, upstep Alpine. La Gazzetta dello Sport reported today, or by the time you're watching this, it's probably the back end of last week, Friday the 8th, that the top dog at Alpine now, Flavio Briatore, has apparently changed his mind about Jack Doohan. Automotor and Sport are also reporting that Colapinto's management team have been in talks with the Alpine team. Now, Doohan, who is a son of motorbiking legend Mick, was confirmed as Pierre Gasly's teammate for next year all the way back in August and has been doing FP1 sessions for the team, as well as testing outside of official Formula 1 and probably a load of work in the simulator as well. His performances in official F1 weekends in those FP1 sessions uh, haven't blown the world away. His junior performances aren't outstanding, they're very impressive, but you know he's not won in his rookie season every single season through the whole thing as some people do. Um, but you know they're perfectly comparable to Franco Colapinto. But what he doesn't have, which Colapinto does, is some actual experience in Formula 1 races. Now, there's absolutely nothing to say that Doohan won't perform as well as Colapinto has, but the Argentine is the new shiny thing in Formula 1 and everyone wants to have him. Franco does also come with some pretty massive sponsors, which will be filling Flavio's eyes with dollar signs. Now, for now at least, this is all just rumours. Um, it's quite a common saying in Formula 1 that every driver is always talking to every team. But it would be a very Alpine move to announce an Australian driver has signed for them who will then actually never drive for the team. The Oscar fiasco proved that when it comes to their drivers and their contracts, the Alpine HR team like to run things a little bit fast and loose. To sign Doohan and then fire him before he's driven a single Grand Prix and replace him with just another rookie, essentially. It would be unbelievably harsh. Jack will have been building his entire life around getting a Formula 1 drive up until this point. The junior drivers who make it to Formula 1, that's been their goal since they were five years old. You know, they've been dedicating every weekend of their lives up until the point they make it to make it to Formula 1. And to then give him a place and then snatch it away from him, that would just be utterly awful. Of course, Flavio Briatore is hardly known for his moral compass, so perhaps the rumours shouldn't be that surprising. 
Obviously, though, Jack Doohan isn't the only driver at risk of having his contract ripped up. Sergio Perez has been living life, let's say, on the edge all season. In June, Red Bull shocked everyone by extending his contract till the end of 2026. Since he got that contract extension, he's rewarded Red Bull with a best finish of 6th place, and he's bought them 19 more points than Nico Hülkenberg has got for Haas. Now, after the Brazilian Grand Prix, where Max Verstappen managed to pull off probably one of the best drives in F1 history, Sergio Perez actually only managed to gain one position the entire Grand Prix. Christian Horner came out and said that essentially Perez's poor performance was just a skill issue rather than anything else. The exact quotes that he gave, and it was in response to a question about whether there was any technical reasons that were holding Perez back or anything like that, Christian said, Not that I'm aware of, there was nothing evident to me in the race. So the Red Bull boss was pretty angry that Checo had failed to make the most of the opportunity to get some points back in their constructors' battle with McLaren and Ferrari. And in that same interview, he basically said that, that they'd really failed to capitalize on the opportunity they had. The consensus among fans and the media at this point is that despite having two years remaining on his contract, Perez will not be in Formula 1 next year. The Sky Sports commentators said the exact same thing on the live broadcast of the race as well. Now, the obvious move for Red Bull in this situation would be to promote Liam Lawson or even Yuki Snowder. I mean, it's probably going to be Lawson if they pick anyone. And then to fill that hole at VCARB, which Lawson or Sonoda will leave, they bring in Isaac Hujar, um, who's currently driving in F2. Hujar is just 4.5 points off the top of the Drivers' Championship in F2, and with two sprints and two features left in that season, he has every chance of winning it. Now, that's not something that Colapinto's done. He's not won an F2 title. But, like I said, Franco's this new hot, shiny thing that everyone wants, and Red Bull are apparently very tempted even with the insane price tag Williams have put on him. Just before I talk about the cost of Colapinto and the insane price that Red Bull would have to pay to get him, and why it's probably a terrible idea for everyone involved, if you enjoy the content we make here at F1 Reverse and you fancy seeing some more of it, why not give this video a like and subscribe to the channel? Thanks a lot. So Williams smartly signed Colapinto to some kind of extended deal when they offered him an F1 seat for the rest of this season. Now, the details of that I cannot find anything about. Um, F1 driver contracts aren't made public anyway, so I'm going to assume they're just not out there in the world to be found. But what we can infer from what's happening at the moment is that Williams knew that they might have a real prospect on their hands, and they signed him to a big contract to ensure that they could protect what they saw as a valuable asset. Because if the rumors are true, if Red Bull wants him, they're going to have to cough up some pretty serious cash. Reportedly, Williams won't accept any less than $20 million to release Franco Colapinto from his contract. Now, that's a lot of money. It's actually more than 16 of the 20 F1 drivers are paid on their yearly contracts. Of course, Colapinto won't be seeing any of that money, but that's how highly Williams rate him. And, by the sounds of things, that price tag isn't completely putting off other teams, such as Alpine and Red Bull. If Red Bull were to make the call and decide that they wanted Colapinto for next season, they might actually not have to foot that entire bill either. Franco is backed by some pretty big companies, and for those companies, if they can get their driver into a Red Bull car, that's pretty advantageous from a marketing viewpoint. The international software company Globant, the South American finance company Mercado Libre, the energy company YPF, or any number of other sponsors, they could all front up a couple of million that they've probably got, I don't know, fallen down the back of the sofa or something like that, and that could help fund the deal, reducing the cost of it for Red Bull. But the reason that Red Bull are even considering Franco Colapinto as an option is all based on performance. There's one little doubt apparently that Red Bull have about Liam Lawson, and it's his qualifying pace. Um, they're just not sure if it's going to be good enough to be Max Verstappen's teammate. They've been impressed by his performance level so far overall, I think. I think everyone's been pretty impressed by how he's done. Um, he's looked really confident as well, which has been good. But they just like what they've seen in Colapinto more. And in Franco, what they've really liked is his mentality. I mean, as much as his speed against Albon, it's his mentality that Red Bull have paid attention to. The way he stepped into Formula 1 with basically no preparation and just straight away being competitive, it's demonstrated a resilience and a mental state that Red Bull think is essential for top drivers. 
For Colapinto and Red Bull though, this really is a move that could be doomed to fail. Franco may have succeeded against Alex Albon, but Max Verstappen was the man who almost ended Albon's career when they were both at Red Bull. Now, the current Max Verstappen is a very different one to the one Albon was up against. He's a champion now, which makes a big difference, so any judgment against Franco's performances will be gentler, let's say, than they were for Albon. But that second seat at Red Bull is probably still the worst seat to have in Formula 1, especially if that is going to be your first ever full-time drive in Formula 1. If Red Bull do pick him over Sonoda or Lawson, then expectations will be sky high because Red Bull will be saying, this guy's better than anything we've got in our junior team or our academy. And I would imagine, assuming Red Bull you know, can put out a decent car, anything short of regular podiums and race wins will be seen as a disappointment. It's just, it's the move that's probably setting Franco up to fail. And for Red Bull, what does that move say about their junior program? Sonoda, Lawson, Isaac Hajar, are none of them good enough for the Red Bull senior team? At their main team, where anything short of championship wins is seen as a failure, why take a risk on another team's junior driver, who they've only ever seen on track, they've obviously got none of his data from simulators or past tests or anything. Why take a risk there when they could take a far more informed decision by picking any three of the drivers that I just named. Sonoda especially, he's not a rookie anymore. He's looked way more settled this year. He's looked far more level-headed. Why not give him a go? Give him a one-year contract or something. You know, roll the dice on him. The message that signing Colapinto would send to the Red Bull Academy is that none of you are good enough, so we're going to look elsewhere. And it's not really going to encourage them to stay with Red Bull in the future. If this deal goes ahead, It'll cost Red Bull far more than money, it'll cost them the faith of their junior academy, and to be honest, it probably end up costing Franco his F1 career. Now at this point, after the silly season that we've had, it's so hard to call whether Franco will end up at Alpine, Red Bull, or back in Formula 2. I think the Alpine talk is probably just being manufactured by Franco's management to try and place some pressure on Red Bull. As I said earlier, all F1 drivers are always talking to all teams, um, just buttering up any potential moves they might want to happen in the future. Even for Flavio, like I said, the guy has no moral compass, but even for him, sacking a promising rookie who hasn't even raced yet seems heartless. Though, no one succeeds in Formula 1 by being kind, I guess, so would believe that he would do it. But I think it's mainly just Franco's management playing games. He doesn't want Alpine. Let's be honest, Alpine are not a particularly good team. Ignore the Brazil result, that doesn't count. He doesn't want Alpine. If he wants to go anywhere, he wants to go to Red Bull. And I really do think Red Bull would hire him. But the problem is, I just don't think it's the right choice for either party. But then again, what do I know? If you enjoy the content I make here and fancy seeing some more of me, or you're a sim racer, or you want to become one, then check out my new channel, Deck Chair Racing. I'll be documenting my journey down the rabbit hole known as iRacing as I take a casual, let's have fun kind of approach to learning how to sim race. By the time you're watching this, my third video should be up on that channel, and it's a pretty good one if I do say so myself. There'll be a link to the channel down below, so go check it out if you're interested, and thanks a lot if you do. Anyway, I was George, you've been watching F1 Reverse, and please don't at me.